us your story, Sarah. Can you just share with us a little bit about you and um, give us a timeline on like how you got to where you were? What, what set it off for you? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, my, <laughs> how I landed in this job actually started all the way in high school. Um, so when I was around your age, um, I had, um, I went to a very predominantly white school um, and we had a government class and we were talking about immigration as an issue. And the, the teacher asked a question, we were watching, I think we were watching like the Daily Show a special about like immigration. And the teacher asked a question of, um, how do you feel about immigration? Are you for it? Are you against it? And I had several people that I thought were my friends raise their hand and say like, oh, I, I'm against immigration. I don't believe that immigrants should be here. And that in that moment, a lot of things clicked for me where I was like, oh, okay, so we're cool up to a certain point and you are never going to see me as somebody that's like should be here or should have opportunities. And even if I see myself as I belong and I deserve everything and all of, all of these great things, that doesn't mean that that isn't something that's imposed on me by other people's perspectives. And so that was when I was like, okay, <laughs> I see, uh, I guess I, I saw the world in that moment and I was like, uh, okay, but this is, this is something that's an issue. Um, and, you know, I had, I had felt microaggressions obviously prior to that, but I think this was, this was the days before TikTok. This was the days before we had social media. We were, we all had a language that we could kind of like discuss these, um, like we barely had Facebook at this time. So it was a little bit different. Um, and so I, I kind of started to learn about like, what does this look like? And I, we, there was an organization in my high school called Latinas Leading Tomorrow. And so I joined that organization and I was kind of able to understand like how my culture impacted my perspective and, um, and vice versa, you know, how people saw me as a Latina woman uh, in, in my, at the, at the time, like in my school, that was like my, my community, right? Um, and um, at the same time, I was also uh, a writer for our uh, county library. And so I was like a reporter do, doing a lot of different writing and, and kind of like learning about um, journalism and different aspects of, of media. And I saw like how influential a lot of our newspapers were and a lot of the content that, was, that people were consuming and like how that really can shape how people see um, see the world around them. And so those things kind of started coming to focus for me. Um, and then when I went to college, I actually interned at the National Hispana Leadership Institute, which is a nonprofit organization in DC, which is where I'm originally from. Um, and I worked on a lot of different advocacy issues and I was able to actually go to Capitol Hill and learn about policy and how, you know, how Congress works and all of that. And so I got that perspective. And then I went to grad school um, at USC and um, it was a master in communication management. So learning again, a lot more about media and how all of that works. And then I sort of started putting all the pieces together um, and, realized that there, there was an opportunity to be able to work in a space where I'm actually being able to make that change of how, um, of basically making sure that where you come from, what you look like, doesn't dictate the outcome of your career. Like that's the main thing, right? We wanna get to a place where it's like, you can be a hard worker and get the reward for that instead of being a hard worker, but not being seen in a certain way because of what you look like or where you're from. So um, it, a lot of it has to do with um, kind of what, uh, what you were talking about of like the, the uh, playing field. We, at work, we call it the built landscape, but essentially like what that, what that playing field looks like, right? And um, there's, there's a lot of systemic issues around um, especially race, um, race can really affect like 
your socioeconomic status and, and all of that. And that plays a, a huge role in how you're able to enter the industry. I think um, when you look at statistics, it's actually amazing that I have the job that I have because statistically, it's very challenging. And I can tell you like on a personal level, it was pretty challenging for me to get the role that I have. Um, but it definitely, um, here, you know, we're definitely taking a lot of steps to make sure that that's not the case in the future. Um, but essentially the way that I, um, that I got the job that I have now um, was like right around graduation, I was interested in going into HR because I really wanted to help people. And I wasn't sure like what that looked like or um, like I said, I'm first generation. So learning, <laughs> learning everything as I go, I didn't really have a lot of people that I could ask um, kind of like how you all are doing right now, like what kind of jobs are out there. Um, and so I was trying to figure it out and I wanted to go into media. So I saw that there was an event at the um, United Talent Agency to become a talent agent. And I didn't really want to be a talent agent, um, but I knew that the HR people were going to be there because they're the people who hire. And, and when there's career fairs like that, you also want to like check ahead of time and do your research of like who's going to be there. Cause that's how I knew that that person was that particular uh, human resources person was going to be there. Um, and human resources is like the people who they hire, they do, um, they make sure you get paid, like all of those like tactical things about being an employee. Um, and so I showed up and I waited until the end of the event where everybody was walking out and I went up to the, the HR person and I knew who she was because I had Googled her. So I knew what she looked like. And, and I asked her like, hey, I saw that you're hiring for an HR job. I'm really interested. And she was like, do you have HR experience? And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> but I'm really good with people. And she was like, great. Um, send me an email and, you know, we'll go from there. And ultimately, I, you know, she really wanted somebody with HR experience. So that didn't work out, but she put me on a mailing list for other jobs. And so that's when I got, um, I got like a, um, like, what do you, like a little email blurb that was talking about a job at Warner Brothers. Um, and so I submitted for that job and they, they called me in, they did an interview. Um, and, you know, they were interested in, some, they were interested in finding somebody that they could really do, um, like really train to do things the way that they like them done. And so as somebody who didn't have the experience, I was the perfect fit. Um, so they, that's kind of how I got my first job. And I didn't actually know that it was in production. Um, I thought it was just like a Warner Brothers corporate <laughs> HR job and, and I got there and it was um, in TV production. So working with the cast and crew on different TV shows. And I had to do a lot of kind of like catching up on learning about the business because I didn't, I had never worked in media before. I didn't know anything about TV production. So I had to spend a lot of time like getting to know people, like making friends on production. So I could learn more about how they work. Um, and then um, the George Floyd murder happened. And that's when we really, um, things, things pivoted in the company. Uh, and I'm sure you all saw on social media, like the conversations really took off. I think there was always conversations, but I feel like they were not taken as seriously, it was not as highlighted. And, and I think it's really unfortunate that this tragedy happened. Um, but it was definitely a huge turning point for our country. And that's when um, companies, really large companies like Warner Media started putting a lot of resources behind this. Um, and they had already done that, but I think it was really like heightened and more urgent at that time. Um, so they were able to like start um, kind of bolstering up different uh, teams. And so the team that I sit on now was created, um, which is the production equity and inclusion team. And so I was able to um, kind of net network my way in. And I know I told them I, I worked for this nonprofit. I was in this, um, I was in a lot of school organizations that did a lot of Latina leadership focus. So that's another thing, like as you're going through high school and college and you're joining these organizations because you're passionate about them, those later become really great um, 
kind of sources of uh, experience that you can use for um, job interviews. And so I talked a lot about the, the different campaigns that I did and uh, in college and high school. So uh, all of that actually kind of came full circle for that role. Um, and it was because it was something that I had always been passionate about my whole life. So I had a lot to pull from. It was, it was a very natural fit and it wasn't like I had to make stuff up, you know, like it was very much like always been a part of, of who I am and what I love. So um, they, you know, they were excited and, and I joined the team. And basically what we've been focused on is how do we make our, our workplace being the, you know, the sets where people film and all that, how do we make that safe and inclusive so that anybody can step in and have a good experience and it's not based on um, the color of their skin or where they come from or their age or their gender or anything like that. Well, I have a lot of thoughts about this, but <laughs> I think, um, you know, it's definitely is something that we see throughout our country is that a lot of our huge corporations, um, and of course not all of them, but a lot of them are typically run by um, white men. Um, there's actually a statistic that says there are more CEOs in this country named John than there are women CEOs. Um, so that just kind of goes to show that there's, um, you know, and, there, and there's a lot of reasons why this happens and we can get more into that um, later, but essentially there's a lot of um, barriers to be able to have more diversity at the top. And so you have a very small pool of decision makers making decisions at the top for everybody else who's at the bottom. And which, you know, as it says, we value diversity and inclusion. That's often, it, it's hard to make that statement when you're, when that's not the reality reflected upon your workforce. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, like I, I work with a lot of like mentees and students. And I think a lot, what a lot of students do is they discount the, the experiences that they've had in school and think that because it happened in school, it doesn't matter or it's just not a big deal, like everyone is doing that, but your unique experience is your own. And so it's what you make of it. And even if maybe in the moment you're like, oh, this isn't a big deal, if it touched you in some way, you definitely remember that and remember that it is valuable. Um, Cause I think, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of students, they don't wanna put that on their resume. They don't wanna talk about it because they're like, oh, it's whatever, but it isn't, <laughs> it's definitely, added to the experience that you bring to the table. Um, one Absolutely. of the really cool things about my job is that no day is the same. Um, working with production means a lot of fast paced uh, work. And it's also, we work in seasons, right? Like, you, you know, when you watch a TV show, you know, around the fall is like when a lot of new shows start and then they kind of go on hiatus. And then we have other shows start. And so, it, you know, there's definitely seasons where, um, there's a lot happening and then there's seasons when there's not a lot happening. So we kind of go with that rhythm. Um, you know, we're, we're usually about like two months ahead of, of what TV schedules you, you see like on TV. Um, but it's definitely, um, it's definitely very fast paced and there's a lot that, that happens in a short amount of time. And then we have a little bit more time to like breathe and, and do more kind of like strategy work and things like that. And then we're back in the grind of things. Um, so it just, yeah, it kind of depends, kind of depends what season we're talking about. Although now with like, uh, streaming, which is, you know, HBO max, Netflix, Hulu, all that stuff. Um, we have, a, there's a lot more content. And so we have a lot more shows that are year round. <laughs> I'm waking up at seven. Okay. <laughs> if it's a really busy day, we, I'll start work at like eight. Um, and, uh, a lot of my, when it's really busy, it's a lot of meetings and sometimes, there, there are days where I'll be in a meeting, taking a phone call and also answering a Slack message, which is like our instant messenger. So there are days where it's just like a lot. <laughs> um, virtually, you know, it, um, we've been doing a lot of workshops. And so I'll do a lot of workshops, um, kind of like these on Zoom, um, but we'll, we'll do them um, with different shows. So the, the shows are on set and, you know, because of COVID restrictions, like I can't go on set, but um, we'll zoom in and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll all be on their phones or their computers. Um, 
most of them phones. Most people don't have computers on production because they're working on set. And, and this includes people who are like building the set. Um, it includes people who are, you know, like lighting folks. Um, the cast, of course, they're not working on computers. So, you know, everybody has um, like the, they're on their phone and they're, they're listening in. And I'm, it's my job to kind of like make sure I'm kind of like the MC. I have to make sure everything is flowing and people have what they need to be able to tune in and listen. I um, work with um, over 500 productions. So a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. So, so I oversee all of um, HBO, Turner, and Warner Brothers. So I, I'm more kind of, I guess you could say like a, I'm like the corporate function side, side of okay. it. Of, of overseeing, um, we're working with the production executive. So that's a really good question. So showrunners work on the, the TV show itself and they run the entire TV show. So they're like CEOs of their TV show. They, they run the budget, they run the writing, they are everybody's manager basically. Um, so they are the creative folks. So they're the, the creators of the show. They run the entire show, just kind of why it's called showrunner. Um, so my job, I, I work under, well, there's coordinators who work on the production and they, they're basically running the logistical things. So they're, they're running the, like making sure everybody has, um, they're getting the phone calls, they're doing the schedules, they're um, coordinating different meetings. So they work under the production manager. Then the production manager works under the unit production manager and it goes up until the showrunner. So the showrunner is really like the CEO. If you're interested in, um, I mean, this goes across all industries, but definitely I, you know, in speaking to uh, TV production, it's really important to be able to speak the language and understand what people are saying. Um, and there's a few resources, like one that you should definitely check out is an anonymous production assistant. That gives you a good day in the life of what it's like to be a production assistant on set. Um, and they have jobs all the time. Um, so that's a really good resource. And then of course, um, <laughs> TikTok is actually a really good resource. Um, we have a lot of our cast. If you check out the Warner Media uh, TikTok, we have a lot of our cast members who will actually like film themselves walking around the studio and they'll show you the behind the scenes. And that's a really good way to learn of like what it looks like. Um, I know my, my favorite TikTok account to follow is um, All American. First of all, I love the show, <laughs> but second of all, they actually do a really awesome job of um, just showing um, the different, like what it takes to make a piece of television because it's a lot of people. Um, each TV show has like 200 to 300 people creating mm -hmm. it. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing because that also means there's 200 to 300 jobs every season. Um, and there's just a lot of different components. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool to see kind of behind the, behind the scenes and kind of learn more about that. And also if you, if you get a, the opportunity to interview, then you're able to really speak to the different elements that you see. So they kind of know, okay, you, you're gonna fit in and you can speak our language. <laughs> I was the type of person that was involved in a million things. So, um, I mentioned I was part of the Latinas Leading Tomorrow. Um, I was also in um, the Gay Straight Alliance. I was in the Environmental Action Committee as a young Democrat. Like I was in everything. I wanted to know about everything that was going on on campus. I was in newspaper. <laughs> so I was like get, getting to know a lot of different people. Um, but I also like to like hang out with my friends. I went to Starbucks a lot. I actually worked at Starbucks in high school too. Um, yeah, so getting into college was an interesting process. I had um, a family friend that kind of helped me keep track of college applications and things. And um, I spent a lot of time talking to my friends and seeing what they were doing, specifically friends who had family members who had already been to college. I was like, I wanna know what they're doing. <laughs> um, and, you know, kind of asking those questions. Um, I talked to my counselor, um, 
I, I thought my counselor was kind of helpful, but I didn't find it like so helpful. Um, I, I think it was, it was hard for me to understand from the counselor's perspective, like what the different options were. So I uh, spent a lot of time on Google. <laughs> um, the one thing that I really wish I had thought of more was like how to pay for college that I had no problem like submitting the applications, but I didn't realize how far in advance you have to start planning for college, like how to pay for it. And so that made it really challenging for me. And I actually ended up going to community college for two years after graduating high school, because I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pay for school. Um, and actually, I'm really glad that I did that because those two years, first of all, saved me probably like $100,000. Um, but second of all, I actually was able to take the time to think about what I really wanted to do and what, what classes I wanted to take. Um, and, and I actually spent those two years um, working to save money, but also interning. So I think a lot of people, I remember in community college, like not a lot of people did internships, but I actually took that time to intern. And that gave, that actually gave me a, a step up by the time that I um, went to my four year university. My first internship was at the Guatemala Human Rights Commission. Um, and I, I found it on Craigslist. <laughs> And I didn't know what an internship was actually. I was just looking to volunteer somewhere because I was like, I don't have any office experience. All my experience is like writing for the library or working at Starbucks, which was like, I, how can I ever get an office job? And I remember like, that was my goal at that age was like, I need to find a job where I can sit down because it's so hard to work all day. And I, and I remember at Starbucks, I worked with people who were a lot older with, than me. And I was like, if I can't do it now, how am I going to do this in like 15 years? I'm like, there's no, no shade to Starbucks. Like, that's a great job, really great benefits. I love working there. But I remember feeling that and feeling like I need to get an office job. And so that's how I found out what an internship was. It's, so it's, it's basically um, where it's kind of like job shadowing. You can watch how people work. Um, you, sometimes it's unpaid, sometimes it's paid. Um, I recommend going for the paid ones, but basically you, you get the, it's kind of like, a like taking a class, but you get real hands-on experience. And so you, you work like 15 hours a week and you get to go to an office and they'll teach you like how to do different projects and different tasks. And then you'll kind of help out where you can. Um, and it's usually about a semester long. So the time that you're in school for, for, um, it's usually like three months basically. Um, and then at the end of it, you, if you do a really good job, you can either stay on for a second internship or go somewhere else and there'll be good references and give rec recommendations for you. Um, so that when you do apply for jobs, you can say, I had this experience and I learned how to do these things. Yeah, I think it, I think that yes and no. I think that there's, I have a, um, so my, my bachelor's is in English literature and I learned a lot about like writing and um, reading comprehension, which super helps me with my day-to-day -day job. Um, it helps me be a really good communicator, which is very key in what I do. Um, but I also think that a lot of us get locked into like, oh my gosh, what is my major in college? What am I going to study? But it's okay because just because you studied that in college doesn't mean that that has to be your forever job. And usually your first job after college is not your forever job. It's just kind of like, a, okay, I'm getting some experience. I'm getting my foot out there, but it's not necessarily like your life path. So I, I would say I definitely... I don't regret my, my college education. Like I love, I loved reading and writing and all that stuff. That's like my thing. I love it. Um, but I think that if, if my job is what you want to do one day, there's a lot of different paths to get there. Um, and don't, um, don't, don't sell yourself short on trying different things. Um, and to add to Wadi's um, question, because I do get this question a lot in terms of like creative careers of how to be a writer. Um, it's, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, it's very challenging. 
However, it's not impossible. And I think that one of the really great ways right now to becoming a writer is creating your content and just putting your content out there. Um, you know, I, I do vlogs all the time, but there's the other ways too. Uh, I'm sure you've seen, um, you know, YouTube videos and things like that. The, the more you build a brand for yourself, and this goes for career too, like you want to build a brand and reputation for yourself so that people know who you are when they, when um, you get to know them. So um, maybe you want your brand to be like, a, you're a consistent, reliable person who's hardworking. That's a great brand to have. People want, people want that. They want to hire somebody like that. So, you know, definitely what, how you put yourself out on the internet and how, like all that stuff really um, can have an influence on where your career goes. I think, especially if you want to be a writer, you want to make sure that um, you can show the type of content that you can create. Yeah, so that will actually, <laughs> this is why you don't discount school assignments. That actually was a school assignment. So um, part of my grad program, I was supposed to do either a project or take an extra class. And I was like, I'm gonna do a project. <laughs> So my, of course, you've heard I'm really interested in writing and I'm interested in Latina advocacy. And so I put those two things together and created a blog. Um, and after graduation, I took some time to like focus on getting a job and working and all that stuff. And then after about a year, I was like, no, I want to get back into it. I really like doing that. Um, and so I put an ad on Craigslist um looking for writers and I got a, a bunch of applications and um yeah now I have this blog with about 30 writers across the country and um we write about all different perspectives and um you know career lifestyle like all those types of things so um yeah it's kind of how everything came to be I think I that, that's a tough question. I think, I think because I feel like there, one of the big things for me was I definitely, you know, coming from a first gen family, I was like, oh, I have to do this like for my family. Um, it took me a while to figure out like, oh, also for myself, <laughs> but that definitely, it never felt um, optional. Like I was like, oh, I have to succeed um, because Otherwise, who will like who who's gonna who's gonna like kind of take on this this work? So um, I think that has always fueled me. And then I think just being, I think like following my passion and doing the things that I love to do that has kind of like kept me going. Even in times when like I've definitely had challenges. Um, I mean, you know, one of the challenges was like going to figure out like, oh, I can't really pay for school. Like, what am I going to do now? And like having to pivot and, and figure that out. I mean, that was a really big challenge. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's definitely, I think remembering kind of like what's important to me, I guess.